It's a really extraordinary honor to be here uh, and to be able to give this uh, memorial lecture. I, of course, uh, unlike so many of you, I did not know uh, Professor Vaishwaduri, but I certainly knew the equation, uh, as every student of this field uh, must do. And uh, uh, one of the strange things about general relativity, which makes it actually quite different from most other fields of physics, is that the theorists were far ahead of the experimentalists and the observers. And so for decades, uh, for almost a century, uh, the theorists starting with Einstein and progressing through many other uh, uh, outstanding, much outstanding work, developed a most extraordinary uh, series of uh, conjectures and ideas that have sparked, uh, that initially sparked much more science fiction than actual astronomical observations. But as, uh, as we have described, by the time the 1980s came around, so many brilliant people had worked on these topics uh, that there was nothing more, I felt, uh, for people with my limited mental capacity uh, to do. And so uh, I perforce became an astronomical observer. And so I am going to do my very best not to talk about physics at all. Uh, and I think there may be an equation somewhere in there, but I hope not. Uh, and I'm going to try to go directly uh, from the basic conceptual ideas behind uh, black holes and related objects to the astronomical observations without stopping for physics at all. Uh, and we'll see if I can achieve that uh, and whether it is worth achieving. So let me start. This is, uh, I, I'm told that uh, uh, Professor Bose uh, a century ago pioneered the idea of the lecture demonstration uh, in uh, a room very much like this uh, right around the corner. Lecture demonstrate, you're supposed to give demonstrations in science lectures, but chemists have a huge advantage in this because they can blow things up. Uh, astronomers are at an enormous disadvantage uh, because you can't actually bring astronomical objects into the classroom at all. Uh, but nevertheless, I have borrowed this small object because I want to try and demonstrate the basic principle behind which uh, the concept uh, which lies behind the concept of black holes. So uh, watch closely. Uh, the principle is that what goes up must come down. Uh, I'll do that again. Uh, what goes up <laughs> must come down. Oh, then I'm, I'm done now. <laughs> uh, oh, one more time in the light. Okay, so here it goes. It goes up, then it comes down. But here's the thing, like so many deep truths about the world, it actually isn't always true. Uh, we live in the space age, and you're all aware, uh, that if I go outside and I were to throw this thing up, and, I, and if I threw it up at greater than 11 miles per second, uh, it would escape from the Earth, it would be going faster than the Earth's escape velocity, and it would not, in fact, come down. And there's a little equation that people learn in high school or in their first year of, uh, uh, of college uh, in which you can write down what the escape velocity is and calculate it uh, for, uh, uh, for any object. If you calculate the escape velocity of a human being, a human being being, of course, a perfect sphere, one meter in radius, and 100 kilograms in mass, uh, the escape velocity turns out to be uh, 80 microns per second. Uh, that's a very slow speed. And therefore, we're always moving faster than each other's escape velocities. And that is why human beings are not attracted to each other. Uh, at least not by the force of gravity. Uh, and, uh, 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 and so the basic idea of a black hole from the point of view of an astronomer is it's simply an object whose escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. Uh, and this was a calculation that had already been done in the 18th century. You could figure out how massive and how dense such an object might, must be, and nobody cared. Uh, it was only uh, when Einstein realized in deriving his um, uh, uh, the principles of relativity that the speed of light is a very special velocity. Uh, 
uh, that the importance of something whose escape velocity is greater than the speed of light became evident. And in particular, it became clear that uh, since light was as fast as anything could go, something whose escape velocity was greater than the speed of light, light could not escape, nor could anything else, nor could any information of any kind come from such an object uh, to the outside world. And so uh, you have an object that from a kind of scientific, epistemological point of view was not really part of our universe at all, because no information could propagate from it to an outside observer. And so this is what made uh, black holes such an extraordinary type of object that it formed a boundary of our universe. And so you had to think of the universe not as a large, extended thing, uh, perhaps with some very distant boundary in space and time, but more like some kind of Swiss cheese, as, as, as a continuum with holes cut out of it, uh, and boundaries to it uh, that you could possibly uh, approach. And so uh, black holes um, are actually quite simple objects. They're, they only contain two things. One is on the outside there is an event horizon. That is the place where the speed of light uh, That's the place where the speed of light is equal to the escape velocity. And so inside the event horizon nothing that happens can propagate uh, to the outside world. And then down in the middle, there is something that's referred to as a singularity. And the singularity comes about because inside the event horizon, uh, the properties of space and time uh, take on a very peculiar form. And, and in particular, the properties of space and time are reversed from the way that they function in the ordinary uh, universe. So uh, what can I possibly mean by that? Uh, out here in the ordinary universe, I can move around in space. I can move backward and forward, I can jump up and down, and I do that by extending energy. Um, and, but I have no choice about where I go in time. I move forward in time at a steady pace of one day per day, uh, regardless of how much energy I expend trying to slow my progress down. Inside the event horizon, this is reversed. Uh, things fall toward the middle, toward the singularity, regardless of how much energy you expend in trying to stop that. Uh, and so you can't stop, turn around, and come back. But that expenditure of energy must do something, and it turns out that it moves you around in time. And this is why black holes are so popular with the science fiction writers, because it provides a scientifically valid uh, time machine. Uh, the science fiction writers then always ignore the fact that once you've made your move in time, you can't come back out. Uh, and so it actually does no good whatsoever because you get crushed into this uh, uh, infinitesimal singularity at the middle of the black hole, and the plot of the movie or book stops right there. Uh, nevertheless, uh, black holes consist basically of an event horizon and the singularity inside. And so they are the simplest objects. Uh, in the universe. So, uh, just to summarize, you probably can't read this from the back, I'm sorry. Uh, it's an object whose escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. The surface where the escape velocity is equal to the speed of light is the event horizon, and no matter energy or information can propagate from inside to outside. Uh, and uh, the matter inside the event horizon falls inexorably downward toward the scene. And now we have a problem right away. Because, did you notice? Uh, my first two slides contradicted each other. Uh, the, the title of the talk is, What Does a Black Hole Look Like? And then in the very next slide, I explain that no radiation, no information can possibly propagate from a black hole. Uh, so it cannot possibly look like anything. And so the rest of my lecture, what I'm going to try to do is explain how it is that an observation of astronomers has anything whatsoever to say about black holes. How can we see these things, the very definition of which is that no radiation can possibly emerge from. So let me start with some historical context. Uh, in 1915, the story begins when Einstein publishes his general theory of relativity, the basic idea of which is that gravity is not a force, 
a manifestation of the curvature of space time. We'll come back to that thought in a little while. Two years later, uh, Schwarzschild uh, developed the mathematical description of the curvature of space time due to a single point mass. And this is something called the Schwarzschild metric. In the middle of the 1950s, we have the famous Ricciatori equation, which shows that singularities, the key characteristic of black holes, are a necessary consequence of general relativity. And then, for the next 30 years, people like Hawking and Penrose and others uh, develop this theory and demonstrate that singularities will inevitably arise uh, from the evolution of stars uh, and at the beginning of the universe. So this is the theoretical background that, uh, uh, that people like myself who study, who try to study these things empirically uh, work with. Now, in terms of the observations, when Einstein did his great work, there was really only one observation of any kind that demonstrated that general relativity was a better theory than the Newtonian theory. And that had to do with the anomalies in the orbit of Mercury, uh, which could be explained uh, by general relativity. But that was the only thing at the time. Uh, there were some other uh, small effects, small deviations from Newtonian theory that were developed. But it wasn't really until the 1960s that anything was discovered in the universe that really required general relativity to explain. And at that point, uh, the development of radio astronomy and x-ray astronomy led to the discovery of quasars, pulsars, x-ray binaries, all of which could be explained uh, as uh, neutron stars or black holes in various configurations. Uh, in the 1970s, the use of binary pulsars, double pulsars orbiting each other, provided stringent tests of gravitational theories, uh, and uh, there were also became detailed studies of accretion onto black holes, what happens as matter crosses the event horizon. Uh, starting in the 1990s, uh, there was an increasingly compelling evidence that certain objects in the sky must necessarily be black holes. There are no other explanations possible within the context of standard physics. Uh, and then just last year, uh, we had the sort of final piece of empirical evidence come forward, which was the remarkable discovery by the LIGO collaboration of gravitational wave radiation from colliding black holes uh, in, uh, uh, elsewhere in the universe. And so I'm going to talk mostly about these last two bullet points, which complete the transformation from the theoretical background of these objects uh, into a field of empirical observational study. So, the plan is this. Black holes exist. They can be observed. We study their properties in detail. And this is interesting because it is an exploration of the boundaries of science and the boundaries of the universe. And so it is as far as you can go and still be a scientist. Uh, so the basic idea comes from uh, the fact that it, it was demonstrated that stars evolved in such a way that some of them must end their life as black holes. Uh, the end point of the, the sun will not do this. The end point of, a, a, of an object like the sun is uh, the mass of the sun gets compressed and compacted down into the volume of the Earth. This is a kind of object called a white dwarf, held up by electron degeneracy pressure, with a density of about a ton per cubic centimeter. So very dense, but not uh, any kind of abnormal matter. Then uh, came a wonderful discovery by uh, a great Indian astrophysicist, uh, uh, Chandrasekhar, that white dwarfs must be less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, or they will, or they will collapse indefinitely. Uh, and uh, this uh, occasion, a, a very famous interaction between Chandra, who was a student at Cambridge at the time, and his thesis advisor, uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, the great, greatest uh, theoretical astrophysicist of his time, Chandra presented his results to the Royal Astronomical Society, and his own thesis advisor immediately got up to denounce him 
uh, and uh, Eddington famously said, um, there ought to be a law of nature to prevent stars from behaving in this foolish manner. Uh, and I think those of us who are teachers ought to remember that if Eddington had believed his student rather than his own intuition, the study of black holes would be four decades further advanced than it actually is. Uh, Chandler was right. Immediately, God gave you was unhappy about this, got on a boat, uh, uh, and spent the rest of his career at the University of Chicago, and 50 years later won the Nobel Prize uh, for this work, which should have been recognized uh, as true much, much earlier on. So, we know there are stars more than 1.4 times the mass of the sun. They cannot end their lives as white dwarfs. What happens to them? Some of them become neutron stars. This is a situation in which you uh, take all the electrons and protons, turn them into neutrons. This is a single atomic nucleus. It's at a very strange place in the periodic table where it has zero protons, zero electrons, and 10 to the 57 neutrons. Uh, and uh, uh, this compacts uh, 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 stellar masses down into a relatively small volume, and now we are dealing with things with 100 million tons per cubic centimeter. Very dense indeed. So all of the subatomic particles are crushed together to make neutrons. These are observable in various contexts, uh, but uh, the important thing is if the mass is greater than about three times the mass of the sun, then the neutron star fits inside its own event horizon. So the event horizon is outside the neutron star, and therefore the entire object must be a black hole. And uh, all you need to do to demonstrate this, all you need to know, uh, are the results of uh, experimental nuclear uh, physics, which tell you something about how neutron stars behave. The only assumption you have to make is that the equation of state is causal. That is to say, the speed of sound is less than the speed of light. And with that assumption alone, you can demonstrate that a neutron star more than three times the mass of the sun fits inside its event horizon. So, what do we have? White dwarfs are the end point of stars with less than 1.4 solar masses. Neutron stars have to be less than 3 solar masses. Stars can lose mass in various ways. Uh, but if you end up with a, a star at the end of its life with more than 3 times the mass of the sun, it must be a black hole. Notice the asterisks. That's, I said before, the thing about great scientific truths is they're not always true. And there is an alternative to this. Uh, it could be that Einstein was wrong. And that general relativity is not the correct theory of strong field of gravity. That event horizons don't exist. Uh, and uh, that therefore, uh, this limit is incorrect. But one of the great things about uh, studying black holes with this set of assumptions is the existence of a black hole, if you have a, a compact mass more than three solar masses, is the conservative assumption. Because anything else, you have to argue that Einstein is wrong. And that is not a pleasant place to argue from. Um, so, uh, the question then is where would you go to find a compact object that is more than three solar masses? And this uh, 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 the starting point for this was the invention of X-ray astronomy. When in the 1960s, spacecraft would launch X-rays don't make it through the atmosphere, so you have to launch your observatory into space. And this is what the X-ray sky looks like. Each one of these dots is a source of X-rays. You can see that they're highly concentrated toward the galactic plane. Uh, this uh, 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 viewpoint is set up so that the galactic plane is here, the galactic center is in the middle, and you can see that these points, these, uh, these uh, bright objects, these bright sources of X-rays, uh, show up in the center of the galaxy. So that immediate, that fact alone tells you quite a lot about these things. Uh, nobody knew what these sources of X-rays were, uh, but the brightest sources are near the galactic center, and that tells us they're approximate distance. They have to be located something like seven kiloparsecs away. Uh, you can observe the flux. You know how many X-rays show up. You know the distance. There's another one of those nice high school physics equations where you know the flux and the distance. 
you can compute the luminosity. And uh, since I've been in India over the past few days, I now understand that the way you describe this is that the luminosity of these things is one lock sun. Uh, and this is actually a very useful uh, numerical device, so I thank you for that. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing is that they emit very, very little optical light. So you have a huge luminosity and almost no optical light. Then you can use another one of these basic physics things and say, uh, if you have a high luminosity and it's all at a very short wavelength, uh, you can figure out what the temperature is. And the temperatures, uh, the thermal temperatures required here are many millions of degrees, thousands of times greater than the surface of normal stars. And so the thought uh, quickly arose that they must be a very peculiar kind of binary star system. This is a binary star system. Many stars come in pairs. Uh, the sun is unusual. It has no stellar companion. Here's an ordinary star, much like the sun, except it's got this curious tidal bulge on it, and it is in orbit around another star that is in the middle here that is so small you can't see it, but very massive. The mass of this star, of this compact object, is so great that it is pulling material off the surface of its companion. That material goes into orbit and into this kind of disk-like configuration and spirals down. Uh, and uh, as it does so, it picks up temperature and in the middle, close to the compact object, uh, reaches many millions of degrees and can emit the kinds of x-rays in the quantity that we require. And this theory of accretion onto compact objects uh, was developed in, at some length in the 1970s to explain the new x-ray sources. So, how would you measure the mass of that compact object uh, down in the middle? We know it has to be a compact object because otherwise it wouldn't generate an, enough energy. It wouldn't have the gravitational force and it wouldn't generate enough energy in this accretion disk to emit x-rays. So you would like to know the mass of something here. So again, a couple of pieces of high school physics. Uh, this is nice. You don't have to learn any theory beyond what you were knew when you were 16. Uh, two pieces of physics. One is the Doppler shift. The Doppler shift tells you that, the, uh, that by observing the changes in the wavelength of light, you can figure out the radial velocity of something, how fast is it coming toward you or away from you. And you also borrow uh, Kepler's laws of orbital motion which relates the velocity of something in orbit uh, to the mass and the distance between the two objects uh, around it. And so here is the plan. Uh, you look at the other star, you look at the normal star, and you measure, repeatedly measure, its Doppler shift. You repeatedly measure its radial velocity. Half the time it's moving away from you and it's red shifted. Half the time it's moving towards you and it's blue shifted. You plot this as a function of time. And you can read off two things, namely the orbital period and, and uh, the projected velocity. And if you take those two things, the orbital period and the projected velocity, put them into Kepler's laws, uh, you discover the minimum mass of the unseen object. This is the key. By looking at the ordinary star, you can put constraints on the mass of the unseen object. If the minimum mass is, is greater than three solar masses, it has to become a compact object, because otherwise it wouldn't generate the x-rays. If it's greater than three solar masses, it cannot be a white star. It cannot be a, a neutron star, and therefore it must be a black hole. Except for the asteroid. Uh, which you will recall, you have to assume that Einstein is right. Um, we'll come back to that in a little while. There's a technical problem. The technical problem in making this observation is that the accretion disk is too bright to observe the companion star. It's much too, uh, uh, more light is coming from the accretion disk, so you can't make these velocity measurements. Fortunately, nature has uh, solved this problem for us. Many of these systems are so-called transients, in which they have short periods of accretion activity and x-ray emission, uh, alternating with long periods of inactivity where no mass is being transferred, uh, when almost all of the light is being emitted by the companion star. 
So here's how you discover a black hole. Uh, you wait for a new source of x-rays to be identified in the sky. Uh, some new transient uh, blows up. You wait. Wait for a while. Eventually the outburst goes away. You identify the optical counterpart. Uh, what, what star in the optical side of Venus? You wait for the outburst uh, to be over. You observe the radial velocity curve of the companion. You calculate the minimum mass from that radial velocity curve. And if it's greater than three solar masses, you win, because you have discovered a black hole. Uh, this turns out, I can testify from personal experience, this is good for your career. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is, a, this is a fine series of events uh, uh, to go through. Uh, and so I'd like to describe how, uh, how this happened to be. This was a while ago now, in the early 19, 1990s. So let, let me describe the sequence of events uh, that I was fortunate enough to participate in. It started with this. This is an astronomical telegram. Astronomers used to communicate with each other by telegrams. Now it's, of course, all done by email, but the word astronomical telegram still persists. All you need to know about this is the title, X-ray transient in Musca. Musca is a constellation, a constellation of Musca the fly, a very little known constellation in the Southern Hemisphere, which I now like very much because it contains this object. So they discovered a new source of x-rays uh, in the constellation of Musk. Uh, later that year, I was down at uh, uh, the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile, uh, a place I like very much uh, because of this. This is the giant four-meter telescope at that observatory, which at the time was the most powerful telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, this is the door, just to give you a sense of scale. And I like this particular picture because of this thing in the foreground, which is a telescope that's owned by Yale. And so uh, I spent a lot of time at this observatory. Uh, this is the, the Large Magellanic Cloud, the center of the galaxy. Uh, the sky really does look like that down there. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, and I was down in uh, observing with this smaller telescope, uh, but I decided that what I had planned to observe was not interesting, and the much more interesting thing to do would be to observe, try and figure out the optical counterpart of the new uh, X-ray transit. So here is now my telegram, which I wrote a few, uh, a few months after the original one. There's two things to notice here. First is my name. Uh, and the second is a, is a comment down here that I had observed a ten and a half hour modulation in the light from this source, which might be the orbital period. Now, if you know the orbital period, you can figure out how great the velocity variations would have to be in order for this to turn out to be a black hole. You just do the problem backwards. And the answer is, if the amplitude from the top of, from the fastest it's coming towards you to the fastest it's going away from you, if that change is more than 800 kilometers per second, uh, with a 10 and a half hour orbital period, it would have to be a black hole. Uh, so with my uh, friends, uh, Ron Rennard and Jeff McClintock, we went back down to this observatory to use the big telescope a year later after the outburst was over uh, to uh, try and make this measure. We got three nights of time. The first night it rained. Uh, this is an occupational hazard of observational astronomy. Uh, the second night, we had hail. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in a six-story high hollow steel building in the hail. Uh, it's a most extraordinary experience. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, my, uh, my colleague Ron from MIT was unaffected by this. And he uh, installed software brought down by a complicated thing called the interweb. Uh, which only people from MIT at that time understood. Uh, and he brought down all his data reduction software and installed it on the computers there. And I remember him looking up at 3 in the morning and saying, OK, we're ready to produce data. And we had to point out that you know, opening the telescope dome in the hail would be a bad idea. So then we went to bed and go to bed at dawn. right? And they have these nice little uh, dormitory rooms, which are light tight and sound tight, so that you can sleep during the daytime. And then you wake up at 4 in the afternoon, and there's this terrifying moment where you open the shade, and 
look out to see what the weather is going to be like that night. And our third night, we had finally the storm passed and we had good weather. So what I want to now show you is what we observed during the course of the night of the 3rd of April in 1992. And to this day, this remains the most exciting 10 hours of my career. Uh, we start at uh, dusk, we end at dawn 10 hours later. Remember, the orbital period is supposed to be 10 hours, 10 and a half hours. And what we have here is the radial velocity. By convention, negative numbers mean that the, something is coming towards us. Uh, and uh, positive numbers mean uh, that the object is moving away from us. So our first observation, uh, the star was coming toward us at 250 kilometers per second. That's already very interesting because that's greater than the escape velocity of the galaxy. And so you can't have that kind of speed unless you're in a binary star system. So already we're in much better shape in terms of understanding what this object is. Uh, we did a couple more observations. By the time two hours had passed, the object we were looking at was no longer coming toward us at 250 kilometers a second. It was moving away from us at 150 kilometers a second. So it had started coming toward us, and two hours later, it had turned the corner and was moving away from us. Further observations follow, uh, and by midnight, we were pretty pleased because it was now going away from us at 400 kilometers a second, uh, and it clearly was starting to turn over. And so uh, it seemed like 800 kilometers a second uh, uh, change between the least and the greatest, which is what uh, we were hoping for, might turn out to be true. Don't get overconfident. Uh, the next thing that happened was an anomalous point. <laughs> Uh, which was not explained in the paper. Uh, what happened was we had a small earthquake. Uh, Chile is prone to such things, uh, and it's a very disturbing thing when you start to feel the telescope dome. Exactly. <laughs> this is bad for high precision optical measurements. Uh, fortunately, there is no procedure for recovering that. The problem is the telescope no longer, you know, the telescope axis no longer points north-south after an earthquake. It a little bit. Uh, and so we had to uh, quickly uh, recover ourselves. And there is an hour-long gap, again unexplained in the paper, uh, where we were running around trying to, to trying to fix the telescope. Here's the next observation once we got it uh, together. And then as the uh, night went on, uh, uh, the star was clearly going back and now was coming toward us again. So it started out coming toward us, moved away, and now was coming toward us again. Uh, but then we were back to where we started at minus 250 kilometers a second. And so we thought, you know, the next point is going to nail this down. And so, but the, here's the problem. Objects rise in the east and set in the west. And so if you're following it all night long, the telescope goes from pointing east to pointing up to pointing west, and the, 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 the optical element, the big four meter primary mirror, is not screwed in. You wouldn't want to screw it in because, uh, you know, screws change their size as the temperature changes, and that'll throw the optics out. So this giant mirror is just sitting at the back of the telescope, being gradually tipped on one side. Uh, fortunately for the telescope, uh, there was a technician whose job it was to keep the astronomers from doing anything too stupid. Uh, and he said to us, you know, uh, 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 gentlemen, you really must stop this observation. We're endangering the health of the telescope. And I cannot permit this to happen. But as scientists do, we said, no, 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 for the good of science, we must immediately stop the observation. And he said, no, 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 for the good of science, we must immediately stop. And he picked up, you know, it's, it's very bad luck if you break the primary mirror of the largest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so he picked up the telephone, this is 5 in the morning, as you said. He picked up the telescope and dialed the number of the director of the observatory. It is also very bad luck to wake up the director of the observatory. <laughs> and so he said, okay, okay, we'll stop, we're good boys. Uh, but during the argument, uh, we had made one further observation, uh, and it was this observation that was made during this little conversation uh, that kind of nailed down 
uh, the 800 kilometer per second amplitude. And so then over breakfast, uh, we computed the best fit sine curve. Uh, this is the kind of thing you do over breakfast. Uh, and um, uh, on the plane ride back the following day, we wrote another one of these telegrams to McClintock and me and Redlark. And here is the uh, money quote the value of the mass function is 3.1, this is the minimum mass of the compact object, 3.1 solar masses provides dynamical evidence that the primary is a black hole. Um, now, uh, there is an error term here. I'll, uh, uh, in the end, it turned out it was much, this is a minimum mass, it turned out it was much, much more than that. Uh, but we, uh, we, uh, So, uh, I'll just yell at you for a little while. Uh, what happened was, we then, uh, we then wanted to write a paper for the journal Nature, but the title of our paper was something like uh, Discovery of a Black Hole in the Constellation of Muska, and the editors didn't like that. They said, well, you can't really be sure it's a black hole, you know, Einstein might be wrong. And he said, don't be absurd, we get to assume that Einstein is right. Uh, and uh, they said, no, 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 extraordinary claims require extraordinary levels of proof. Uh, you can't call this a black hole, you can only call it a dynamically confirmed black hole candidate. Uh, so that's what these things are. Uh, this abbreviates to DCEHC. Uh, and uh, uh, here is, I should say, better data that was obtained uh, two decades later. And you can see this is an absolutely beautiful sign. There's few things in nature are more sinusoidal uh, than these uh, uh, nice circular moments. Um, and uh, so, as I said, you end up with a minimum mass. Uh, you don't really want to know the minimum mass, you want to know the actual mass of the, uh, of the object. Um, I think I won't go into detail about uh, uh, exactly how, how this is done, but it is possible uh, to determine the true mass rather than the minimum mass by determining what the inclination of the orbit is, how ticked the orbit is. Because that tells you the difference between the projected radial velocity and the true velocity of the source. Uh, so, uh, rather than go into detail of that, let me just pass through, through these, let me simply show you uh, the current list of dynamically confirmed black hole candidates. Uh, this, this, is to, this is to scale. Uh, here's the Sun and Mercury for scale. Here is, uh, this is the object in Muska that we were looking at. It's one of the smaller such systems. Uh, some of them have orbits as long as 30 days, some of them have orbits as short as four, uh, uh, as four hours, and all of these have now been dynamically confirmed uh, to have compact objects in them significantly greater than solar masses. This is now a sample. And one of the curious things we found is that black holes tend to prefer to be approximately seven times the mass of the sun. Of those dozen or so objects, uh, eight or nine of them are seven times the mass of the sun. I published a, a, a paper at one point in which I said, you know, we discovered seven of these objects, and they're all seven times the mass of the sun. And I got a lot of messages from religious people telling me that uh, various gods of various denominations were speaking through my work because seven times seven is a, clearly a holy number of some kind. Uh, the Christians were particularly adamant about this. Uh, and, uh, but it was curious because both of those sevens were completely contingent. One of them depended on the fact that we were using the mass of the sun as a unit. Uh, you could also say it was 1.4 times 10 to the third one, which is in kilograms, which as far as I know is not a holy number. Uh, 
Um, and it's also true that the only reason there were seven was that we had to observe the other 300,000 such objects that we think existed. Yeah, Nevertheless, uh, I, I was pleased to know that the gods were smiling. Uh, now I want to go back to the asterisk. Remember the asterisk? The asterisk says uh, that a compact object of seven solar masses, for example, must be a black hole unless Einstein's theory is wrong. But you can reverse the question. And as I was talking to the students earlier today, sometimes the more interesting thing to do is to ask the question backwards. So the original way of thinking about this was, if general relativity applies, then the compact object must be a black hole. But consider a different question. If the compact object, if it's more than three solar masses, is not a black hole, then general relativity is wrong. That would be a very interesting thing to discuss. So then what you do is you take these, this group of, compact, of uh, uh, dynamically confirmed uh, black hole candidates and you look to see whether they behave like black holes. Because if they don't, uh, then uh, you, if, whether they do or not, you've said something about uh, strong field relativity. And in particular, if they don't behave like black holes, um, then there's trouble. So, how could you test this? One of the characteristics of black holes is that they don't have surfaces. They have event horizons instead. And so if you drop matter onto a black hole, it doesn't hit a surface. It goes straight through. On the other hand, if you don't dump matter onto anything else, for example, a neutron star, the infalling gas will hit the surface. And if it's falling fast, uh, you know, there's energy. And energy is good. Oh, okay. uh, what I need actually is a piece of chalk. Do we still have chalk in the universe? Uh, and if you, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll do this conceptually. If you drop chalk from a great height, it breaks when it lands because the kinetic energy has turned into energy to grow the global thing apart. If you drop material onto a surface of a neutron star, uh, it ends up going, oh, thank you so much. Let me break a piece of chalk for you. Uh, let's see. Uh, see what happened? Another one of these great demonstrations. Uh, the kinetic energy which the, uh, uh, which the chalk carried broke it apart on landing because it had to stop and that energy had to go somewhere else. Uh, if you drop stuff on a neutron star, what happens is you get a boundary layer uh, where the material which was falling at close to the speed of light, because these are very relativistic objects, close to the speed of light suddenly stops and a large fraction of its mass energy has to go somewhere else and it comes out in the form of extra x-rays. And so you predict that the same amount of matter falling on a black hole and falling on a neutron star, that the neutron star would emit far more energy uh, because most of the mass energy of material falling on a black hole simply falls through the event horizon and disappears from our universe. So here's the data. Uh, the open circles are the luminosity of accreting neutron stars. Uh, the, uh, uh, the darker points are the uh, observed luminosity of accreting dynamically confirmed black hole candidates. Um, this is a luminosity on a logarithmic scale. This is minus 8, minus 7, minus 6, minus 5, minus 4 in Eddington luminosity units. So this distance is two orders of magnitude between this group and this group. Uh, and that seems to me to demonstrate that there is a dramatic difference between a comp accreting compact objects at 1.5 solar masses from accreting compact objects with 7 solar masses. Now, you do have to understand what this axis is. This is the orbital period. And uh, one of the things that happens is larger orbital periods generate more mass transfers. So you expect everything to be brighter in that direction. But I think this is a very interesting observation which would tend to suggest that dynamically confirmed black hole candidates actually do have eventual
Uh, I should mention, uh, this is not the only kind of these stellar mass black holes with seven solar masses and not the only kinds of black holes in the universe. There are also the so-called supermassive black holes. These are uh, the explanation for the quasars that were discovered in 1962. Uh, these are uh, men very massive, millions of solar masses uh, uh, at the centers of distant galaxies, also powered by accretion of material. Uh, the origin of these massive black holes is not so clear. Uh, one of the nice things about the stellar mass black holes is we have a decent theory of where they come from. That's a little less true for the supermassive ones. Uh, but we have, by now, very powerful evidence, in these cases too, that we're dealing uh, with black holes. And that, uh, the most powerful evidence, comes from the supermassive black hole in our own galaxy. Our galaxy is not a quasar because uh, the black hole in the middle of our galaxy is not a complete mass. Uh, I should show you where it is. In this picture, the center of the galaxy is up here. Uh, here's a better picture. This is, uh, uh, again, a Chilean observatory. The center of the galaxy is something called Sagittarius A star. There's a little bit of radio emission that comes from there, so that's a radio designation. Uh, but if you look at uh, infrared light, uh, what you see, and they have, the, the group at UCLA has done this over a, a, almost a 20 year period. You see stars in very clear orbits, moving around in orbits around nothing. Uh, and uh, they're all centered on a point down here which has no emission at all. Uh, and you can take that, you can figure out how big that orbit is, you know what the orbital period is, you use Kepler's law. And you discover that these things, these all these stars down in the middle, very center of our galaxy, are moving around something that is four million times the mass of the sun and is otherwise completely invisible. Uh, so there is something down there that's four million solar masses that's pulling all these stars. Around. So that I think is uh, also compelling evidence uh, for existence of black holes, but this time, supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies. Then last year, something even more interesting happened, namely the discovery of gravitational waves, direct evidence of gravitational waves. Gravitational waves uh, were a prediction of Einstein, he, he suggest, pointed this out already in 1917, uh, and the idea is this comes from the curvature of space-time due to a, 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 a single point mass. If you take that point mass and you move it back and forth, then the curvature changes and you end up propagating away in space-time curvature out from that object. It's exactly the same thing that happens with electromagnetic waves. You take a charged particle and you wave it back and forth. That's how you generate electromagnetic radiation. If you take a mass and you wave it back and forth, that generates gravitational radiation in exactly the same uh, kind of way. Uh, and uh, how do you wave a mass back and forth? Well, you put it in orbit around another mass. And then it goes around in circles. And that, uh, uh, that motion generates gravitational wave radiation. That is the theory. Indirect evidence came for this from the in spiral of binary pulsars. Binary pulsars are double neutron star systems, uh, and you can track them with very, very high precision uh, due to the uh, pulse radial emission that comes from these things. And it was discovered that some of these objects are gradually spiraling together. That the Newtonian idea that you stay in the same orbit forever is wrong. They're spiraling together. Why are they doing that? because they are emitting gravitational wave radiation, and the energy that that takes away is extracted from the orbit, which gradually gets smaller and smaller. And indeed, uh, all orbits do uh, emit gravitational radiation, but most of them emit it in such small quantities that it doesn't seriously affect the orbital period. Uh, anyway, they gave the 1993 Nobel Prize to Halston Taylor for discovering this indirect evidence uh, for gravitational waves from the in-spiral environment also. Then, uh, last February, 11 months ago or so, uh, the LIGO Observatory, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory, announced a direct detection of gravitational waves 
from in-spiraling double black holes, so two black holes spiraling together and merging. Uh, there were two uh, experiments that had been put together, and I'll uh, show you how this works in just a minute, in two places in the United States, both of which observed the exact same thing. So here's how you do this. The, the effect of a gravitational wave is to change the sizes and distance of things by extremely small amounts, uh, by a part in 10 to 21. Uh, so how do you measure a change in length uh, of, a, of such a small thing? And you do this by laser interferometry. You send the laser out, uh, you split the beam into two, two perpendicular directions. It goes up, some of uh, these things I think are six kilometers long to a mirror, bounces back and forth, and you tune, uh, you tune the way this mirror works such that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the laser that goes out here recombines with the laser that comes this way in uh, destructive interference in such a way that the troughs meet the peaks, the peaks meet the trough, and nothing makes it to the detector. But if you change the length of one of these things by an extremely small amount, uh, then the interaction can become constructive, and you actually see something at the end. And because it bounces back and forth so many times before it comes through, the change in size can be extremely small, a tiny fraction of the wavelength of light, and you will still see a noticeable signal. Uh, an extraordinary piece of engineering in order to do this. Difficulties in maintaining uh, uh, the precision of this instrument, uh, given the you know, many mile long size of these evacuated chambers, uh, is really quite extraordinary. Supposing you got this to work, what would you expect to see? You would expect to see that as these two objects spiral together, they will get closer and closer to each other. The frequency of the radiation will therefore go up, and the amplitude will also go up because the gravitational strength of the gravitational radiation will increase as the speed of the orbit increases as the objects move together. And so the predicted signal is what they call a chirp, uh, a, 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 a wave with increasing amplitude and increasing frequency. So that sounds like this. That's a chirp. It gets louder and it gets higher in pitch. So here's what a chirp looks like in, uh, 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 in, uh, in visual terms. Notice this takes a tenth of a second. Uh, because these are very rapidly rotating things. And notice on this axis, uh, the stress here uh, is a part in 10 to the 20 on top of the bottom. And so here's the amazing thing. I remember this press conference, it was the most extraordinary thing. This is what they saw in Washington State. There's a model driven through it, but the data is more than a twinkle. And you can see that there is a modulation that gets higher in amplitude and higher in frequency. In Louisiana, they saw the same thing. And if you put these two signals on top of each other, observe thousands of miles apart, you see the same thing. And the gravitational wave has passed through, passes through the Earth in both these places. And whatever seismic noise or other problems you have, are unlikely to be identical in Louisiana and Washington at the same time. Uh, and in fact, you can do a little calculation, which they did, about what is the probability that you will see such an identical noise spike. And the answer is, this is about a 15 sigma positive signal for a celestial event. Um, really quite, quite remarkable, you know, it looks just like the textbooks. Uh, 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 you know, here's what the textbooks look like, here's what this looks like. I know this because I wrote such a textbook. Uh, this is figure 9.4 in the textbook that was published two years before the other picture. I mean, it, it isn't really. Uh, but it looks just like you put the, the, thing, the thing that gets predicted right here. It's really, really quite extraordinary given the engineering difficulties involved. You can figure out where these things come from. And I want to talk a little bit about LIGO not as a physics test, not as a test of gravitational physics. This is clearly a huge work. They will certainly get the Nobel Prize for this sometime very soon. 
But as an observatory, what does this tell us about astronomy? Due to the light travel time from whatever source it is, uh, you expect that there will be a delay in when the waves arrive at one observatory compared to another. And indeed, there was such a delay. Uh, it says here, and you probably can't see it, that they have shifted the data from Washington to put it on top of the data from Louisiana. They had to make a shift of eight milliseconds in order to get it locked up. That just means that if here's one observatory and here's another, and it's coming from the top, it gets to this one first. Uh, and that tells you something about the direction that it has come from. And with two observatories, you carve out a kind of, this is a picture of the entire sky, here's the galactic plane, uh, you carve out a kind of arc on the sky where this object could come from. If you had three observatories, you would get another arc here and you would pinpoint the position. And so the plan is, uh, that they are going to build a third LIGO station so that you can identify where these things come from and it's going to be constructed in India. This has recently been approved. It's called Indigo, uh, uh, which is the Indian uh, Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This is now approved and in progress, only they won't tell us where it's going to go, uh, except that it's going to be in India. Perhaps somebody in this room knows more about this than I do. Uh, part of my mission in India is to nose around to try to figure out uh, where exactly they're going to do this. So if you do happen to know this, please, by all means, uh, whisper it into my ear, and I promise to, uh, promise to spread the paper as quickly and as, <laughs> as fast as I can. Uh, but in the third one, this is going to be of great importance because then you can actually pinpoint where, this, where the waves came from and look for electromagnetic counterparts of these events. The other interesting thing that I found uh, was the mass of the sources. The frequency of the mergers correlated with the total mass of the system. Larger masses have larger event horizons, longer orbits, and lower frequency. And so the mass of the first event, they could figure out the masses of the individual objects that merged together, were 29 and 36 solar masses. Uh, but I just told you that there are always seven. Uh, so this was a little bit disappointing and a little bit worrying, but on the other hand, it's a good thing in that every time a new form of radiation is detected from the heavens, whether it's radio astronomy, X-ray astronomy, gamma ray astronomy, you see things that you haven't seen in any other form. And so the gravitational waves uh, are following suit, and we're seeing black holes of an intermediate mass, a greater mass than the stellar, uh, uh, than the stellar, than the observed stellar mass system, and we don't know why. That said, I have to confess that I was a little pleased that when the second event was reported, there are now two of these things now, the masses involved were seven, 14 solar masses, so it's obviously following the rule of seven after all. And so once we've got seven of these things, we'll know exactly what's going on. Uh, the point here is that uh, we have now, in the 21st century, we are building on the theoretical work of the 20th century to explore in an empirical way strong field general relativity. We found dozens of dynamically confirmed black hole candidates, and they turn out to behave like black hole. There are supermassive black holes, which are also being discussed, uh, 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 examined in great detail. Merging black holes can now be observed through their gravitational wave emission. And thus, we have a whole series of different kinds of detailed empirical studies of strong field general relativity predictions. And so what this means is that general relativity now looks like every other kind of physics. Namely, that the observers finally, at long last, have caught up with the theorists. And what they did in 1917, in 1915, in 1955, in the 1960s and 70s, and finally, in 2016 and 2017, uh, we have ourselves uh, uh, an actual observational empirical science to go along with the extraordinary theoretical was done by people like think they are and many others uh, uh, long ago. And so finally, we've caught up with the genius of our forebears. Uh, and so with that, I'll just uh, uh, conclude. 
And uh, if there's time, I don't know if we have time for questions, but if there were, I'd be happy. Thank you. Thanks to Professor Charles Perry for his uh, interesting lecture. It's a wonderful lecture that you have heard. Uh, he has started from the very definition of the black holes and uh, ended the 21st century black holes. So I would like now to invite uh, questions from the audience uh, regarding this lecture. Why do you know where the uh, uh, seven solar mass black holes are roughly from the X-ray observation? Do you have any idea where the these black hole mergers for the X-ray took place? So uh, uh, we have, we know something about the distance uh, just from because if you know the mass, you know what the luminosity has to be. So from the amplitude and, and the mass determination. Uh, you know the luminosity compared to the flux, and so we know that these are extra galactic, and they are extra binaries in other galaxies. One of the remarkable things about these mergers uh, is that at the moment of merger, the gravitational wave of luminosity is greater than the luminosity of everything else in the universe, and so you can see these things in very distant galaxies. You can see them across virtually the entire universe. Billions of light years away. This particular one that they saw first, not surprisingly, was relatively close. You see the bright ones first. That one was, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it was like 200 megaparsecs away. So it's in a very distant galaxy. Uh, that's good because these things don't happen very well. The predicted rate of black hole mergers in our own galaxy is one every 10 to the seventh, 10 to the and the second one, uh, the second one was further away, uh, and uh, I don't remember the details. Uh, the predicted rate of discovery of these things, they've tuned up their instrument, they're now in their second run. The predicted rate of discovery of these things is that by three years from now we'll have a hundred. Uh, so we're going to, you know, us X-ray astronomers are going to lose control of this field really, really fast. So we're looking forward to that. Yeah. What about the neutron star and black hole? Ah, neutron star black hole mergers will also be visible uh, in exactly the same way. They have a slightly different waveform, uh, but they should also be visible also at large distances. And one of the interesting things that's going to come out of this is uh, what the mass ratios of these uh, double compact objects are. Are they always within a factor of two of each other, or do, does the fact that there are many more neutron stars than black holes we expect mean that uh, black hole neutron star mergers will be much more frequent? The first two were double black holes. This was something of a surprise. Do you think black hole exists in our gravitational balance? Not sure what. Do you believe black holes exist for gravitational balance? So black holes, existence of black holes comes about uh, uh, as a result of the evolution of perfectly ordinary stars and galaxies. And therefore, uh, it is not the case that most of the mass in the universe is in the form of black holes. Uh, so the black holes, if you ask questions about, you know, uh, uh, could the black holes uh, contribute to making a critical mass of, of, of mass in the universe, the answer is no. Black holes are pretty, uh, pretty clearly only a small fraction of the mass of the universe. Most of it's in other cases. Um, I just want to know, uh, you said that these small mass Unexpected. Mm -hmm. Now suppose you didn't have the extreme that the extreme What sort of experience would you expect? You'd expect exactly in a previous state. So, so the way these things would evolve in a previous a precursor. So 
this, the objects I studied, we used to call them dynamically confirmed black hole candidates. Now we call them gravitational wave precursor systems. Uh, because you start with a black hole in an ordinary star, and then that ordinary star and it goes to supernova, and you end up with a double black hole system. In its precursor state, you would expect exactly the same kinds of X rays, uh, except that when you made your mass measurement, you would get a much larger amplitude. Uh, and so the X rays themselves in, are not expected to be different. And indeed, the X ray emission from the, the high energy emission from the supermassive black hole is astonishingly similar if you scale it properly to that from the solar mass black hole. So here are objects which differ in mass by eight orders of magnitude that have very similar behavior. That's one of the strong arguments that they actually are black holes. If you take any other object in the universe, a star, a human being, an elephant, what have you, and scale it up in mass by eight orders of magnitude, it doesn't look the same. But black holes do. Sir. Um, Sir, um, you said that objects within uh, the mass of three solar masses, they, uh, uh, they become neutron stars. So, what is the force which uh, prevents the gravitational collapse? Ah, so, good question. What prevents the gravitational collapse of a neutron star? What it is, is, uh, what prevents the gravitational collapse of a white dwarf is the degeneracy pressure of the electron. That uh, uh, it's the Faraday pressure that you can't put two two objects in the same place at the same time. Neutrons also have such a degenerate pressure, and it's that pressure that holds the thing up. And indeed, it would continue to hold the thing up, except that what that means is, as it gets more massive, the object actually gets slightly smaller uh, because it needs more pressure to hold it up. And as the as a neutron star becomes greater than three solar masses. Its radius is smaller than its eventualizer. And so that's, uh, that's the difference. And so uh, Chandrasekhar's limit also applies to neutron stars, but at a much, much smaller radius, because neutrons, uh, the wave function of a neutron is much, much smaller than that of an electron. So you could predict it's 1,800 times smaller uh, than it would be uh, if it were electrons. So that tells you the difference in size of neutrons, but it's the same kind of very degeneracy pressure, except applied to neutrons and stuff like that. This is strange measurement in the two black hole collision. Yeah. Strain is 1 in 10 to the power minus 21. Mm. So could you elaborate a little how do they do it? Yeah, so uh, they, they do this by laser interferometry. So you have two perpendicular evacuated tunnels, yeah, four kilometers, and, and so uh, if you're measuring a side, a difference in distance between the two mirrors of 10 to the minus 18 centimeters or something, uh, 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. Uh, and that's, of course, a very small thing. And so the only way you can do this is by repeated, so it's actually not four kilometers, four kilometers times however many uh, reflections you have. And then, because you're very sensitive to changes in the relative phases in two directions, uh, that when it recombines, sorry, when it recombines, when, when it interferes, uh, tiny changes of a very small fraction of a wave will make measurable changes in the amount of interference. Yeah, and so and so you have a light detector at the back end, and you tune the thing so that most of the time it's purely destructive interference and you see low light. If you start to see a little bit of light, something has changed in size. And you and, and it really is an extraordinary piece of engineering to be able to do this. Very impressive. Oh, you were talking about uh, the probabilities of observing the black holes. Uh, I was asking that uh, if you want to observe a black hole through uh, the gravitational waves, and there is also a way of observing black holes by the stellar waves. So, how does the probabilities differ and why? So, the gravitational wave radiation only occurs when the two black holes spiral together. So, it occurs for a few seconds in the 10 to the 8 year long lifetime. So it has a very, very small piece. So, so you expect, as I said, 
uh, the, the rate in our own galaxy is one every 10 to the 80 years. What makes the experiment possible is that it's so strong that you can see it, if you can make this measurement at all, that you can see it anywhere in the universe. So in the X-ray observation, we can see many X, you can see most X-ray bodies. There are a few dozen of them that are easily seen in our own galaxy, but you can only see them in our own galaxy because, you know, they're bright, but they're not that bright. Whereas there are many fewer events for the gravitational waves, but you see them across the entire universe. And I think if, if, if you believe the predictions of the sensitivity of these things, it will be true within a couple of years that they will have detected more black holes through their gravitational waves than through the universe. Sir, thank you for the wonderful talk. I have a question that we observe stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. So the difference in mass scale is huge. Why don't we observe uh, black holes which have mass in the middle, in the Excellent mass scale. question. Intermediate mass black holes, IMBHs. Uh, this is a fairly intense field of study. Uh, people have identified some uh, candidates, all but one of which have other explanations. Uh, and there is, but there does remain one, one object which I believe the estimated mass, they haven't done this, uh, the, the true mass measurement, but the estimated mass by scaling relations of what the x-rays look like is something like uh, between 100 and 1,000. So if that's true, that's a true intermediate mass black hole. But I think the reason you see, but you certainly don't see many, the reason is that the evolutionary processes that lead to these things, if they're single stars, they end up a few solar masses. If they're whole galaxies, they end up with thousands of millions, and there just isn't a way to produce them in great numbers. Thank you for such a wonderful talk, sir. My question is, you were saying that in accretion disk, accretion disk was uh, more brighter than the star that's orbiting it. And nature do give an, us opportunity to observe. Uh, how is that? I mean, ah, so it turns out that the accretion is intermittent. And the reason for this is that these accretion disks have instabilities. Uh, what happens basically is material flows into the accretion disk uh, and, it, and it doesn't get down to the black hole, it just gets more and more dense until the temperature in the accretion disk ionizes the hydrogen. And at that point, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you have much greater viscosity and essentially the whole disk flushes itself down on the black hole all at once. And so and then you start the process over again, you build up the disk bit by bit, uh, and, but you're not seeing very much of it. Uh, just because all that's happening is the disk is getting thicker. And then something happens, you reach a, 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 an instability, and the whole thing falls down at once. And so it, it's just an unstable, uh, uh, the accretion process is unstable. One more question. No, sir, I was just uh, thinking that uh, you tell after we go India, we can have a 3D, uh, I mean, a pinpoint location of, a, of the different, this kind of events. Uh, how this data from these laboratories can make this 3D picture? Uh, so, what you need, if you have three places where you're observing, uh, if the, supposing, supposing the three are all on this table, if the if the uh, uh, things are coming from on top, there's no time to, uh, the uh, waves reach these three points all at once. But if it's coming in this direction, it'll hit this one first, then that one, then that one. And if you have three different uh, uh, observatories, you have two independent time delays. And that gives you constraints on two different angles, which is what you need uh, to position it on the two-dimensional uh, sphere of the sky. So you need, it's a triangulation problem. To do triangulation, you need three points. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so if you only have two, there's a whole arc 
all of which are uh, uh, give you the same time delay, but you need that first point to break the generous. Hello. At the end of this session, we thank Professor Charles Bailey 